were some of the firstborn of the flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. I, I think he had a boo boo lip. God doesn't let him walk. Probably when I was told his wife, God doesn't let him walk. Okay, told his kids, God doesn't let him walk. And you see, Ralph, he's pouting. That's what his face down. He was pouting. Because God didn't like his offering. And while these two sons of Adam brought an offering, I can t I, I, it's my opinion that the attitude behind each of them was very different. And that led to the quality of each offering being different. Literally. Cain walked through his garden and went, I gotta give God some stuff. And he just started picking up stuff. And uh, I was out in the field the other day, and uh, I was telling Susie this, that had a uh, beautiful, these were table tomatoes. We haul uh, uh, tomato paste tomatoes. And we, they put them in big bats, and, and they just throw them all in this thing. I don't know how it works yet. I gotta get a tour of the plant this week. But uh, I was out, and there's table tomatoes, and I found one about that big that was glowing red. Beautiful, right? You know what they do with those when they go through the field? They throw those away. The only thing they pick are the green ones. Because they take the green ones into Perez uh, and Sons down here, and they gas them so that they all turn red, and then they put them out in your supermarket. That's right, it used to be a produce guy. That's right. And so they put them out in your supermarket so they all look the same. Okay? So here's this beautiful red one. Look, Side, almost like a softball. That was pretty good eating, I gotta tell you. And if I get to that same field this week, I'll get some more, okay? So call me if you want tomatoes. I mean, this is my last week to work, so your, your tomato source is right now. And so, so if you want tomatoes, let me know. Uh, uh, so, but, but that's what Abel did, or Cain did. He just walked through and just started grabbing stuff. Now, what did Cain do? Or what did Abel do? Cain's the oldest guy, he was the farmer. Abel was the younger brother, he was the, the, the plot manager. He took the very firstborn of his flock, the tenderest and the best meat. Anybody here like tender meats? I like tender meat. You know, that's, you take the young You don't take the old milk cow that's been around for nine years. That's not going to be like eating you know, jerky. You know, and so you want, the, and that's what Abel did. He took the very best, the firstborn of his flock, and took to God. God wasn't happy with the one, but he was very happy with the other. Look again at verses 6 and 7. This is, and get this, God is still talking to man face to face. Okay? He's not writing a letter. He's not sending a prophet. God and Cain are about to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not, but excuse me, if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must master it. In other words, God's saying to him, Cain, hey, get your attitude right. Get your attitude right. Joe's not in here, but I asked before, I just said, what's attitude? What's attitude? Everything. Everything. Attitude is everything. Decisions have consequences. Decisions mean something. If you make a decision with a bad attitude, guess what's going to happen? This going to be the consequence. It's going to be bad. You can't make have a bad attitude and make a good decision. You, you really can't because the fact that your attitude is bad it colors everything in your life around you. That's why once you start down a road that's negative and you start down a road that's bad, it's hard to make a good decision because your attitude becomes so negative. Everything around you, everything's against you. You can't make a good decision. God said, hey, Cain, wake up. You and I must be sure that we give to our God the very best we have. We need to want to honor him with our best. That was what Abel did. He didn't take the old nasty milk cow. He took the firstborn of the flock, the youngest, the tenderest, and said, God, here is my offering to you. So I contend that Adam was a great teacher about giving to God. But there's one even better. The sons of Adam were taught to give, but secondly, God taught his son to give. Now, the God of the Christian Bible, and the God of Jesus Christ, 
has always required that people give him offerings. Now, at first class, one might say, well, what kind of a God is this? Just so man. Some people go to church and say, you know what? All I, every time I go to church, all I want is my money. I know churches that have taken up an offering before. They had it counted before they left, and it wasn't enough to cover the bills, and they passed the plate again. I have really heard a church that's doing that. I can't believe that, man. That's just like crazy. But, but, but I was there to do that. Church goes, well, the first thing you do is, well, the first thing you do when you get to church, you pass an offering plate. Well, that's one reason why we don't do it. You know, we want you to participate. We put a box back there. We give you offering envelopes. You know, we don't do that by accident. We want to encourage good behavior, but we don't want you to feel guilty. Okay, pass the offering plate. Here's your guilt offering. It's not what we're after here at all. But churches will do that. So people will get this wrong thinking about God. We want to challenge our thinking about God and about giving back to Him. And for this, we want to go to Galatians. We went from one G. Let's go to another G Bible uh, book. Galatians, right after 1 and 2 Corinthians. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, the first chapter. And this is Paul's introduction to the churches of Galatia. Now, let me explain it. Galatia wasn't a city. Paul is writing to an area. It would be like saying all the churches on the west side of, of Stanislaus. Okay, it's kind of like he's writing to a bunch of different churches. And, and he's saying that, well, let's look what he tells us about this demanding God. Galatians, the first chapter, starting verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That may be why Ken Hayes Campbell opens most of his letters to you in some particular matter. Good enough for Paul, good enough for, for me. Verse 4. Uh, let me start again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God, uh, uh, of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Ken, what does that mean? That means God the Father asked his, how many sons did God have? One. One. He asked his one and only son to go and become an offering, a gift. A gift that would do what? That would rescue us. He gave himself as a gift for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Man, I wish Paul was living now. Yeah. I can't imagine what he'd call a mess we're living through right now. I mean, you know, that was, by the way, it was bad back then. It's still bad, right? It's still bad. I don't know what, I think it is worse. We just find out about it quicker. I think that's about the only difference. But the Heavenly Father, think about this, was teaching Jesus' his Son the value and importance of giving. Jesus, I need you to go to earth and give yourself as a living sacrifice for me. It's going to cost you everything. In fact, you're, you're not going to live. You're going to, you're going to die. The Heavenly Father was teaching His Son the value and importance of giving. With that in mind, now let's go to John 3.16. Now keep it here in Galatians. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But go to John 3.16. Think about God's gift. See, so many times when we read the Bible, we put ourselves in the focus. We, we make it all about us. Think about God for a moment. Let's go to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son... God gave his, how many sons did he have? One. One. I got three. How many of my kids am I giving for you? None. Straight up. Love you all. Most of you. And you figure out who, who I don't. But, but I, I love you all, but I'm not giving any one of my three boys for you. Seriously. Done. We're, we're not, it's, it's, it's not even in the room. God said, I will give my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The pivotal passage here is God giving. God giving. You see, we always want to make it the other way. Oh God, I, I am so burdened because you expect me to give back to you. Who's the greatest giver in the universe? God. God gave His one and only Son for us. And maybe you're still a little fuzzy about the nature of God along with His love and His giving. Keep your finger in Galatians, but this time go to 1 John. That's towards the back of the Bible, just before the Revelation. 1 John chapter 4. 
this is the Apostle John's commentary on John 3.16. Okay, this is the expanded version of John 3.16. Here's what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse, starting verse 7. It says there, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Jesus is the ultimate example of God's love and of his giving. It's so hard for us that on the cross, how much did Jesus give? All of it. Jesus didn't say, can I, can I just hold back a little bit here? Okay. I, I, I'm looking at a really cool car, Lord. Can I just hold back a little bit of this? He gave everything he had down to his blood and his last breath. No, I don't understand. I don't understand how when he was on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Now see, I'd have thrown in scumbag in the middle of that. Father, forgive these scumbags, they don't know what they're doing. He didn't do that, did he? Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. I, it's one of those times I look at Jesus and I say, duh. But that's how giving God is. Son, go down and die for the scumbag. <laughs> and we're not allowed to call ourselves scumbags, but we are. And Jesus died for us. Before we could do anything, God gave his son. Who's the greatest giver in the universe? Yeah. God. So Adam and Jesus learned to give, get this, from the very same source. Adam and Jesus learn to give from the very same source. And that leads us to this, this third and final part today. And that is thirdly, we must learn to follow these examples. There have been times in my life that I've made some, I think, very good excuses for not giving to God. Very, very compelling excuses. We've all done it. You know, hey, God, you know, I can't, can't give this week. Can't give this week, Lord, because blah. See, when you and I do that, what we're actually doing is we're denying the gift of God that he has given to us. Here's the passage that helps us have the right attitude. Go back to Galatians. I promise you'll be back there. Galatians, that's the second chapter this time. Look at verse 20. Galatians 20. Phillips, Craig, and Dean, they sing a beautiful song about this. And it's, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that song. That is, that is, that is just one of those songs I can listen to every day. It's just absolutely beautiful. When we are immersed into Jesus, born-again believers we are, we become. We are crucified with Him. We become united in His death and His burial. His crucifixion and His burial in the tomb. As well as His resurrection. That's the beauty of immersion. Boom. Boom. Up. Okay. Alive. Dead. Up. That's it. Crucified. Buried. Risen. That's the, the thing that goes on here. And that means, according to the scripture, our thinking should change. Because we are now alive in Christ. The problem is, I've never seen anybody get up out of the waters of baptism and say, I'm throwing away all my bad habits, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> now, by the way, we say we're going to do that, right? And to some extent, we do. Uh, one of my favorite groups right now is Casting Crowns, and one of their songs that's, that's still being played right now is called It's a Slow Fade. Okay. It's a Slow Fade. And, and it's when you, 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 you give yourself away. And it's a slow fade. In other words, you, it, when uh, black and white turn to gray. It's kind of the same way, though, in our Christian growth. So I get baptized in September of 74. I didn't give up many habits that next week. Because I like all those bad habits. They fit me rather well. But guess what happened is I grew in the Lord. And I grew in my understanding of the Bible. One at a time, the bad habits went out the window. 
So if you went from 74 to 84, you just see quite an improvement in Canada. 84 to 94, now I'm getting old. 94 to 2004, now 2004 to 2012. I'm not the same guy I used to be. Ask my wife. Don't ask for too many details. It might scare you. Yeah, but folks, praise the Lord. Because slowly but surely, I am trying my best to reflect Christ more in my life. Because Christ gave himself for me. Oh. And our giving to God and to Jesus is to be a total giving in all the different areas of our life, just like Christ gave on the cross. Giving without limits as a born again follower of Jesus Christ. Sold out to Jesus like he is sold out to us. How big, how much does Jesus love us? This much. This much. That's how far he was nailed to the cross. How much should we love Jesus? Not this much. Not this much. Not this much. We gotta learn to love Jesus this much and give him the same thing. Jesus held nothing back on the cross. When we're born again, we must die to our old ways. And one of the hard things to do is to give up hoarding. I like hoarding. stuff. Hoarding. 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 I didn't say hoarding. I said no, no, no. Hoarding or hoarding. Let me make something clear. You ought to give that up too. Yeah, that's an issue. Hoarding. Boy, enunciations. Oh, I'm glad this is on the internet. And so uh, one of these days we're going to have this recorded and put up on the internet. That will really be scary. But thank you. That's why my wife's in here. I hope I didn't. Unclear of the first service. Uh, Susie would have corrected me. Uh, hoarding, hoarding worldly things, you know, that rust and moths and thieves can take. Because the problem is, we can hold this stuff right here. And the problem is, we want to hold on to it so much. And I understand that. Uh, uh, we were standing in line yesterday, and uh, uh, we went and abused cars yesterday. Joe and I did. It was really a whole lot of fun. You know, you drive a 430 horsepower car very much. The guy said, hey, step on it. <laughs> yeah! It was great. Get, ask me later. And, and, and so this guy's in line, and he goes, uh, I was talking about the train museum, and he goes, I got this cabinet out of an old Pullman train car, and I'd like to give it to the museum, of uh, the California Train Museum. Do you have a car to use? I said, no, man, just get online. I know they're going to want this thing because it is it is a whole gorgeous cabinet they took out of a Pullman car. Pullman was the best way to travel in the 20s and 30s. They, it was the luxury travel of the day. And this was a first-class car where you could hang your clothes and do all that while you were traveling across the country on a train. It's good that the guy wants to give it up. What are things in, your, in my life that we wouldn't give up? That's the stuff we're hoarding. Did I get it right there? Hoarding. <laughs> That's the stuff we're hoarding. That's the stuff. And when somebody says, well, I want that buried with me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. you got to ask yourself, whoa, what are we holding on to here? I don't want nothing buried with me. Take the ring. Melt it down. I don't care. You know, my kids, I'm, it's all getting burnt anyway. Give it to science. I don't care. Okay? Because... And it's easy to say, but I still buy stuff, right? Do I need really any stuff besides a tent to live in? Okay. Do I need a car? I can do a camel. I don't like camels. They spit. Okay, but I mean, but part of our culture is we need a house. We need a car. We need a car out here because mass transit is not a good thing out here, you know. So I we were with like a couple yesterday, and she doesn't mind riding the bus. I'm like, I, that's not where I grew up. You know, and she grew up in a place where there wasn't a bus, Leesburg, Missouri. Look at that one. That's one of those Leesburg, Missouri, population 26. Salute. You all, you hee haw, man. And so, uh, worthless little city in the middle of nowhere. There's no bus service there. I'll just trust you. Folks, cars and houses and televisions and cable TV, there's nothing wrong with it until what? It controls us. Until we've got all these bills that we can't give a tithe to God anymore. Oops. What's more important at that point? Our stuff. I wouldn't like living in a tent. But letting go might not hurt. So our motivation for giving back to God should come out of an appreciation for what he gave first to us. And that's Jesus there are five motivations for giving, and I hope you'll write these down, and, and uh, uh, I'll try to remember to send these out uh, in an email as well this week. Five motivations for giving. 
and they progress from worst to best, worst to best. The first bad, or the first motivation, which is the worst, is guilt. I have to give it. I have to give it. And it's very weak because you don't cheerfully give when you have to give. It doesn't bring God praise. I think that's what Cain did. Okay, Dad says, God says, i got to give him something. Just go and start throwing stuff in the basket. Now, here's a tomato with a brown spot. Oh, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. See, that's guilt giving. That's, that's guilt giving. Guilt giving is when, when, when the plate comes around, you throw a 20 in, and then you realize you made a mistake because all there is is other 20s. You can't get, your, you can't get any change back. I know people that take change from the offering plate. Yes. Yeah, because all they want to give is a five, so they're looking for change. That's guilt giving. I have to give. That is not going to get blessing from God. I just want to let you know that. Number, number two is responsibility. I ought to giving. Now, this is better, but it's still weak because it limits the joy. It's a, it's a giving out of reluctance. It's a reluctant giving. There's no open hand that, that comes from the open heart. Here, God, take this. No, it's not that. It's, okay, God, take this. And what do you want to do? You really want to walk back and grab it and take it back with you because you really don't want to give it. Thirdly, is needs giving. Get, I want to giving. Now, it's seeing a need and it's giving towards it, and there can be joy in this. This is not the worst. It's certainly not the best. We'll get to that in a moment. Because there's times when there's a real need, but you just don't recognize it. Uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association. For 40 plus years, I don't know when Jerry Lewis started those telephones. Late 60s, early 70s. I remember watching the black and white TV in my mom and dad's bedroom. We moved from that house in 73. So it was before that. And I remember sitting there watching that going, I, we need to give $5 to that. And I think I talked mom and dad into it once or twice. Well, mom, dad, dad. Yeah, I wasn't giving anybody to anybody. And so, but, but what happened after the telethon was over? I forgot it. I forgot there was kids with MDA until next year when the telethon came on. So that's the problem with needs-based giving. There can be a real need. You just don't see it. Fourthly, is Thanksgiving. I can't help it giving. Thanksgiving, I can't help it giving. Now, this is pretty good. It brings joy, and it, it is positively contagious. Because you can walk up and say... I just thank God, and I want to give this car. I want to give this. I, I, I want to, I, and we did a building project in in uh, in, in, uh, in Finley, Ohio. And we had we had somebody give uh, their vacation house forty thousand dollars. Was it much for We had to put an eight thousand dollar roof on it. That was another issue. But, but they gave their forty thousand dollar vacation house on the lake to the church because they were thankful for what the church done in their lives. Not a bad deal. Thanks. Giving, giving. But, but here's the problem here. It can be based on how blessed you feel. In other words, you're making $100,000, but you have $150,000 a year in bills. Do you feel blessed? You feel under pressure. Okay? Now, you're blessed beyond measure that I can even understand. But at the same time, you don't feel blessed. Thus, you don't give thankfully. So what's the best? It's the fifth motivation. The fifth motivation is worship. It's just my nature giving. It's by far the best. And it grows out of faith and understanding of what God has given to us. When you look at the cross and you look at what God gave you in His only Son, it should cause you to want to worship Him in spirit and truth. And worshiping God in spirit and truth also means a tithe. Because you realize you want others to get to know who Jesus is too. You want others, you want missionaries in other countries to, 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 to help small children and orphans and everybody. You want people to understand who Jesus is. So you say, God, I love you. Thank you. And here is a tithe. And here is more. And you still give to special needs. And you give to this and you give to that. I don't give to MDA anymore. Other people will do that. I'm going to give to Daughters of Ruth. I'm going to give to I Mercy. I'm going to give to Care Haven. I'm going to give to Precious Heritage in the Philippines. Because I want to give to places where my money is going to help somebody else get to know Jesus Christ better. Somebody else will give to these other things. And by the way, there are other good charities out there. If you want to give 
100 bucks to uh, Muscular Industry Association, you do that and do it and give God praise for it. But remember, worship giving needs to be our goal. Now, the first place to start giving is not the offering box back there. I don't want you to go back there and bow before the offering box and stick a check in there. That's not it. The very first place you need to give is yourself to Jesus Christ. That's where it all starts. And in fact, Paul said that in the 2 Corinthians. We'll, we'll, we'll have that scripture in front of us hopefully before this month's out. He says, they first gave themselves to Jesus and then to us, which meant they first devoted themselves to Christ spiritually. And then when Paul's need came about, guess what they started doing? Writing checks. Well, they didn't write checks those days. They gave cash. They gave, they gave Roman uh, money. That's where we need to start. You and I giving ourselves more to Jesus. That starts by being born again. And that means giving him our allegiance and our love beyond everything else in our lives. If you're not sure about where you're at spiritually, you and I need to talk. And we need to talk soon. The Bible's clear about all this. It's, it's so simple. I, I love to just sit down with us and share what the Bible says. You bring your Bible, I'll bring mine. I'd love to talk to you about that privately. So during this next song, if you need to learn more about giving yourself to Jesus and becoming